Not all historical eras are created equal. Some eras are so perfect for a beginning costumer that they scream, make me, every time you look at them. And some are so underrepresented, so horribly difficult, that they will reduce you to a bubbling pile of sobbing flesh and tangled thread. Hi, my name is Jackie and I've spent the last two years trying many historical eras for the very first time. And I've done all this work so you, intrepid costumer, can know which eras, when done first, will bring you ultimate joy, and which ones will make you sob into a river. So grab on to your popcorn, folks, because we're about to get salty. Tears. Coming in at the top of the list is absolutely. These eras are simple to construct, are well documented with low cost or free resources, and require small amounts of fabric and little skill to create. Next is prior sewing experience. These eras are great for beginners, but may require some basic construction knowledge that might be difficult if you've never used a pattern before. In addition, they may require you to make a My First Structured Underpinning TM before you can begin the thing. Our C tier option is It's Gonna Cost Ya. These eras will suck up your time, your cash, or both, though they're relatively simple to construct. So if you're brand new to historical costuming, you could start with these eras, but it's going to take you a full year to make the whole kit, or your wallet is gonna suffer. Ask me how I know. Next on our list is if you like crying. I mean, some people are into masochism. That's your bag. I'm not gonna judge you, just buy some tissues first. And in the position of shame, the worst of the worst, the eras you should never do as a beginning costumer, we have, nope. And just a quick note before we start roasting, this is not going to be an exhaustive era list. I'm sticking to eras that I have some knowledge to speak about. So this is going to be Western European and American styles in eras that I've done or have spent time researching. I know some of these eras better than others and don't claim to be an expert on anything here, but doing them for the first time. And except for when noted, and there are some exceptions, I'll only be speaking about feminine presenting clothing. Once doublets start to pop up, masculine clothing becomes very tailored and not beginner friendly at all. I've split each era into its own separate chapter. So if you're interested in something specific, you can skip to that if you'd like. And I would love for you to tell me in the comments what era you started with, or if you haven't started, which one you're hoping I'll say is a good place to start. Some of these might surprise you. Regency. First on our list is the Regency era. This is roughly from 1800 to 1825. Jane Austen, Bridgerton, yes, that Regency. Characteristics of this era are an astronomically high and prominent bust, empire waists, and puffy sleeves. Regency, I dubbed the previous sewing experience. This is a pretty good starting era. A short sleeve Regency gown only takes about five yards of fabric, budget-friendly lightweight cottons are historically adequate, and there are a ton of available available sewing patterns out there, a lot of them are cheap. The only thing that keeps Regency out of the absolutely category is that you do need a pair of stays for this time period. However, a pair of Regency short stays is a great way for a newbie to wet their feet in corsetry because they have no waist shaping, contrary to popular belief, and are short so they take less materials to make. Worst case scenario, you can get away with a well-fitting push-up bra if you need to make it to an event in a rush, though I don't recommend that for long term. I will say that my rankings do assume that you're also making all of your historical underpinnings. And y'all, historical underpinnings are 100% necessary except when otherwise stated. So if you have the money to purchase your underpinnings or at least your stays and corset, you can safely move any era one rank up my list. So for example, if you're buying Regency stays from Red Threaded, then Regency would actually be in the absolutely category. After making one of the S tier costumes, Regency is a perfect second project, especially if you want to get into some of the other eras that require corsets. In addition, all costumers should have at least one Regency outfit in their closet, whether you like the style or not, because it will open so many doors for you for events. Everybody everywhere does Regency. It's a good thing to have on hand if you actually want to wear the costume you make to a place. Natural form. Next is the natural form era. This little nugget of fashion runs from 1877 to 1882. That's it. It is the cream between the bustle flavored Oreo. You can identify this era by its fitted bodices that extend over the hips and the skirts, which have a narrow silhouette and then explode at the bottom with ruffles and bows and ruffles and bows and ruffles and bows and even more freaking trim all over the skirts. 
Now this era is the least structured of all the Victorian eras when we're talking about skirt supports. You can get away with a small fabric bustle pad and some roughly petticoats underneath. However, you still need a corset. These bodices are tailored beyond your wildest imagination, and you will spend as much time making your trim as you will the rest of the gown. So, my dear natural form, I'm going to put you in if you like crying. Romantic. The Romantic period runs from about 1825 through 1850, but I'm specifically speaking about the, shall we say, height of the era, which was about 1825 through 1839-ish. How does one describe this era of clothing? Giant bell skirt, belted waist, giant puffy sleeves, and the wackiest, craziest hairdos. Basically, this is Regency on acid. This era is the most divisive out of all time periods for fashion, and you either love it or hate it. FYI, and I'm not the only one to experience this, but I hated it until I tried it. And now I love it. It's so ridiculous in the most fun way possible, and it is a joy to wear because it's so goofy looking to our modern eye. Believe it or not, this isn't the worst era for a beginner, especially if you dip your toes into Regency first. A pair of Regency long stays is historically appropriate through about 1830. So if you've got a pair, they'll double for this era. And then all you have to worry about is a petticoat and sleeve plumpers, which are both quick and easy projects. In addition, there are a lot of patterns available for this era for reasonable prices. And the construction is pretty basic with both the skirt and the arm size shaped through gathering, which is extremely forgiving to new sewers. Where this gets ya is the fabric. You're gonna need about 10 yards for the giant skirt and sleeves, plus more for the trim and the hairdo, which is the best part. So while this isn't a bad place to start, it's gonna cost you. 1790s. Vive la Révolution! The 1790s is a transitional period between the more structured 1780s and the loosey-goosey Regency era. It's recognizable by its higher waist, thrustier décolletage, and voluminous gathers usually held at bay with a nice wide sash. This is a very comfortable, easy breezy era and a really good starting point for those 18th century enthusiasts out there. A chemise gown or round gown only take about five or six yards of fabric, are mostly gathered rectangles and can be built to be completely adjustable at the neckline, waist, sleeves, etc. So it's a very forgiving project that will hide many flaws. In addition, historically adequate sheer cotton walls are relatively cheap to purchase, making it an economical make as well. Slightly fewer patterns out there and you do need to make a transitional pair of stays for this, but like Regency stays, they're a good first supportive garment project. So like Regency, we're gonna put the 1790s in prior sewing experience. Ancient Greece. Y'all know what I'm gonna say. Whether you're interested in delving into this era or not, this is hands down the best first project you can and should do as a beginning historical costumer. This baby is going straight to absolutely. And let me tell you why. It is literally just a tube of fabric sewn at the side. Then you hem the top and the bottom, fasten it with pins or buttons, and boom, it's done. A complete novice could make this in a weekend, and someone familiar with a sewing machine could literally knock it up in an hour. This is why it's so good for your first make because now you have an incredibly comfortable historical garment to wear to events that requires no historical underpinnings. Now that you have the thing, you can turn your attention to another era that interests you, which takes longer and costs more without having to miss out on events because you haven't made a costume yet. In addition, these generally take about two and a half to three yards of fabric, depending on its width and your height. So you could even just use an old sheet. It's very economical to make. And it also works for masculine presenting bodies. You just stop it at the knee instead of the floor. Even better, it's great lounging gear when you're at home. And with the right accessories, you can just wear this as a modern day dress, which I do. So this is not only cheap and easy, but it is extremely functional mid-Victorian working class. This is a broad generalization and not my area of expertise, but for this video in particular, it merits mention and separation from the fancier styles of the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. I'm talking no frill day dresses or working gowns from any of these decades, great for middle-class impressions or even pioneer reenactment. Why? Because if you're dead set on only doing Victorian clothing ever, which I don't recommend if I'm honest, 
because it's a much better practice to have a varied and flexible collection of eras if you want to go to events, then this is the place to start. The only place, by the way. The nice thing about working class is that the silhouettes are much simpler. The fabric is simpler, there's less trim, and you don't really need a structured hoop to wear underneath. Now these styles do require a corset, albeit usually a less structured one than their upper class counterparts, and do average about seven yards of fabric, so it's still a little bit more challenging, but it's definitely a lot simpler than the natural form, so I'm putting this in, it's gonna cost you. 17th century. Oh, 17th century, shall I compare thee to a Texas summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperamental. Y'all. 17th century clothing varies greatly from the beginning of the century to the late, from the bizarre and unflattering transitional early decades to the beautiful mid to late styles that went straight to the heart of Louis XIV and yours truly. This is my favorite era, hands down, for the sumptuous fabrics, the giant poofy sleeves, the low cut necklines, and highly structured bodices. This era is the reason this YouTube channel exists in the first place. But the entire century, though varied, has one thing in common. Nope! There are almost zero patterns out there for this era, and the ones that do exist are A, in very expensive books like this one, which retails for almost 60 US dollars, and B, are based off of the few remaining extant garments from this era, which means you need to understand how this era comes together with little instruction and be skilled enough to scale up a line drawing to fit your particular body. Most of these extant garments, in addition, are from the less flattering early 17th century, with there being very few options if you want to do the pretty stuff, which is about 1650 through 1690. In addition, you're looking at larger amounts of fabric, maybe eight yards or so, depending on the decade and whether you want to train. And the bodices of this era are structured. They're stays. Not easy. And you'll have to go through all that work only to have nowhere to wear it because nobody does events in this time period. There is a reason I've dabbled in so many other eras the past few years when I've wanted to focus on the mid to late 17th century. And it's because it's taken me this long to do the research and improve my skills enough to do this century justice. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that I came into the historical costuming community with more than 15 years experience sewing in a professional costume shop. You should do the 17th century, please. But for the sake of the gods and your sanity, don't start with it. 1890s. Speaking of puffy sleeves, and yes, I do have a bias. The 1890s is a really great era and another one of those that every costumer should pick at during some point of their journey because it's extremely flexible and good for many events. The nice thing about this era is that there are a lot of separates, which means you can make a small capsule wardrobe suitable for any occasion. While those mutton chop sleeves do eat up a lot of fabric, the skirts are only supported by a soft bustle pad, which is easy and economical to make. Therefore, the skirts don't eat up as much yardage, especially if you piece the corner of your skirt panels, which is absolutely period. And if you're interested to see me try and make an 1890s fantail skirt using only half the suggested yardage, don't forget to subscribe and hit the little notification bell because that is a video I plan to do in the next few months and I'm really excited to attempt it. Another great thing about the 1890s is that it's mostly separates. With the right styling, these separate pieces can serve you for some fun history bounding everyday wear. I mean, Bernadette. Now you do still need a corset for this era, though I will say an 1890s corset in a pinch will get you through basically the entire Victorian era. So it's definitely a multitasker. Corsets are harder than stays, and for that reason, I'm tempted to put it lower, but I'm feeling a little generous right now, so I'm gonna put it in previous sewing experience. But I would say a lot of previous sewing experience, not, you know, you've made a chitin and that's it. Edwardian. Similar to, but not the same as the 1890s, we have the Edwardian period, which is roughly the next decade, 1900 through 1910. The silhouette here changes from the more upright 1890s look to the very distinguishable thrusted chest and retracted hips known colloquially as the pigeon breast. Doing the pigeon. <laughs> this era was all about a tiny waist in proportion to the bust and hips with additional bust and hip approvers common to make the waist appear here to be smaller. It's an illusion. So we're talking even more extra undergarments to make for this era, 
although they are all relatively simple to do. What really makes this era more difficult than the 1890s is the trimming. All the trimming. Lacy, lacy trims. Lace on the chemise, on the drawers, on the petticoat, the corset cover, the insertion lace and the gowns, extra delicate fabrics. Basically, fiddly AF. Not for the faint of heart, but you're not dealing with hoops, so I'm gonna put this era in, it'll cost you. But like the above era, it's really going to cost you in time, money, and patience. Y'all, lace is not cheap. Mid 18th century. While fashions throughout this era, 1720 through 1779, changed over time, the general method of construction and underpinning requirements stays the same. The mid to late 18th century is an era where many like to start, especially because like the Regency era, there are a lot of 18th century events. Having just one or two 18th century gowns from this era or later in your kit is smart and handy if you actually wanna to go to things, even if it's not your era. In addition, there are a lot of great affordable patterns and resources out there. And if you're prepared for the long haul, you can teach yourself every single historical sewing technique you need just by partaking in the 18th century journey, from the pockets, to the chemise, to the stays, to the hip support, to the gown. In addition, these can be as simple or as complicated as you want and are generally flattering on most bodies. However, there are a few things that separate this era of history from its later cousins. Firstly, where the later decades of the century were all about the butts, this part of the century was all about the hips. Making a bum pad is a heck of a lot easier than making pocket hoops or worse, a pannier. You really need to use hoop steel for those if you want them to not collapse under the weight of your skirts. And whenever you start having to wrangle steel boning, you run into cost issues and equipment issues and honestly, skill issues. In addition, while Robe la Française, the most ubiquitous gown of this century, is in fact the easiest and most forgiving to make because it's not fitted in the back, you're looking at like 10 to 30 13 yards of fabric for that thing, plus all of the trim which you need to hand make. And the other standard style from this era is the pleated English gown, which while requiring closer to seven or eight yards total, will make you cry trying to pleat that back to your body, especially if you don't have help. Ask me how I know. Hip era of the 18th century, you're going smack dab into if you like crying. American Civil War era. This is specifically American fashion from 1861 through 1865. As a colonizer living in the American South, I don't feel like I'm in a position to speak about this era with any form of authority. In fact, I believe we should stop doing this era Period. I know the gowns are gorgeous, but it's time we stop perpetuating the deranged romanticization of a period of time in history that causes so much pain and trauma in others. There is a place for this era, especially in education, but that is not a role that should be played by someone who looks like me. Even if this era was easier or cheap to make, which it's not, it's one of the most difficult and costly, this era would still belong smack dab in the bottom of the nope category mid-Victorian hoop era. So we're talking basically the late 1840s and 50s and the late 60s, right before baby got back. The styles change, the level of trim and sleeves change, but the undergarments and fabric requirements remain similar, so for the sake of time, I'm lumping it all together. We're talking giant bell skirts over huge ruffled petticoats and hoop skirts or elliptical cage crinolines, plus your standard corset and basically a minimum of nine yards of fabric, not including lining or trim, y'all. As I said before, hoop steel is incredibly expensive, especially for this era, because you need so much of it to get those giant crinolines made. And doing circular nonsense with hoop steel is so difficult. I know a lot of people like this era, but honestly, when I sit there and listen to seasoned costumers talk about how hard making an elliptical crinoline is, I can't help but label this as anything but nope. Medieval. Running from approximately 1200 to 1500, the medieval era sees a lot of changes, especially in the later years. For the sake of simplicity and length of this video, I'm gonna generalize here and talk specifically about the styles before the advent of the Renaissance in Italy. So let's say pre 15th century. This is a very easy style to recognize with simple shaping, no boned undergarments, and long flowy skirts. This is a great era to start out with and it's going straight into absolutely. There are a ton of resources out there for beginning sewers for the medieval era and the construction is extremely simple for both feminine and masculine bodies using only basic squares and triangles. The only underpinning you need to make before you make your outfit is a smock as many of these gowns are 
self-supporting. In addition, they're great first drafting projects and there is even a free resource out there that shows you how to make a supportive kirtle without any kind of pattern. While some of the over gowns do take a ton of fabric, a basic kirtle or coat hardy can be done using five or six yards of fabric, especially if you piece the skirts so it's an economical and easy place to start. 1780s. Like the earlier chunk of the 18th century, the 1780s is fairly simple to construct outside of all of its underpinnings. The distinction between these two eras is visually obvious. Instead of a wide, narrow hip understructure, all of the volume goes straight to the backside via a false rump. While all the other underpinning rules of the previous era still apply to the 1780s, mainly you need stays, chemise, pockets, under petticoats, etc., making a false rump is quick and easy and costs very little. There are several good free patterns out there for them, and they only take about a yard of fabric to make. In addition, the pleated English gown runs out of fashion in the 1780s in favor of the Italian gown. While the term English gown is still used for this style, there is one recognizable change between it and its predecessor that makes it a much easier style for beginners. Instead of the back being pleated down into the skirts, the bodice is seamed and separate from the gown skirt, which means it requires significantly less fabric and is astronomically easier to construct and fit, especially on your own. The other styles we see in this era, the development of the chemise gown, for example, and the polonaise, are also simpler and less costly to construct. So we're putting the 1780s straight into it'll cost ya. And a side note, as some of you know this already, but if you're watching this video as it airs, I'm currently running a sew along for the Angelica gown by Scroop Patterns, which is an Italian gown, and there's still time to participate if you'd like. Renaissance. The fun and frustrating thing about the Renaissance is that it varies greatly from region to region and from period to period. Some areas and periods are already using structured undergarments like farthingales and bone bonuses, and some are still carrying over from the medieval era with self-supporting garments and petticoats. I'm very new to this era, just about to start it, and can't speak in depth about much of the areas, but there are a few similar notes between all of the places and times. The lines are still quite simple without a ton of crazy shaping. Some of the gowns are self-supporting. There are a lot of great patterns out there with lots of sleeve and bodice variations, which makes each physical pattern quite flexible. But we're starting to see larger yardages and more importantly, copious amounts of trim. Those witches in the Renaissance were obsessed with trim. You know what's really expensive? Trim. We're gonna go in, it's gonna cost you. First and second bustle. Did someone mention large backsides? There are two bustle eras. The first runs from about 1868 through 1876, and then the second runs from about 1883 to 1889. The styles are very different, with the first bustle era having a much softer sloping bustle with insane amounts of trims and frills and bows and craziness, and the second bustle era is very tailored and structured with asymmetrical details and a bustle that could hold an entire tea tray. Needless to say, these are not good eras for newbies. Firstly, you're looking at huge amounts of fabric because you have to have a gourd skirt and an overskirt and trim and you have to fit it over a giant ass. The structure of these bodices are complicated and require a lot of shaping and tailoring. It takes forever to make all of that trim. And you're dealing with a bustle, which is only slightly less of a pain to make and only slightly less expensive than the cage crinoline. You need a chemise, drawers, corset, petticoat, corset cover, don't do this unless you like crying. Roman. Like its Greek predecessor, the Roman era is extremely simple in design, using only basic rectangles for both masculine and feminine clothing. Drapey, easy, comfortable, another two and a half to three yard make that requires zero pattern, just the ability to sew a straight line. In addition, a Roman stola, which I know is for women of a certain marital status, yada yada, requires other stuff over top of it, but we're keeping it simple here for beginners, guys. This is a super fast make and absolutely adorable when worn as a modern day sundress. Y'all, I wear my stola all the time. I made it out of handkerchief linen and it's now a wardrobe staple. Please make one of these. I will say it's slightly more complicated than a chitin, but it also looks a lot more modern without effort, so it might be better if you wanna do double duty. This is going in absolutely. Vintage, 
plus. Our last historical era is not really a historical era. And I'm talking about vintage, which is for this purpose running, let's say from 1920 through 1980. I want to speak about this just because when I ran my initial poll for the eras I should do, there were a lot of people bringing eras from this period up to me. Vintage is its own thing, has its own groups and events, and while it definitely has some crossover, I don't consider vintage a historical era because for the most part, all of it is wearable every day without any kind of stigma. While there are underpinnings you can purchase to make the looks more authentic, for the most part, everything from this era forward looked fine with modern underwear. That being said, if you are a beginner and want to start into historical costuming, but are overwhelmed by the options and the time and the money it's going to cost, picking a vintage pattern and doing that first is not a bad place to start. Definitely going to be more complicated than making a chitin, but it's still going to be translatable to every day, which makes it more cost effective. So I'm going to put this in previous sewing experience because I will say that vintage patterns do a lot of assuming. So unless they're like simplicity reproductions that have been done in modern day, there will be a lot of things you'll intuitively need to know to get it right the first time because it won't be mentioned in the instructions. If this video has given you inspiration and you're ready to start your historical costuming journey, I've got the video just for you. It's all about how to actually start doing the thing and it's one easy click away right here on the screen. This was so much fun to make y'all. Thank you for watching. I love y'all and I'll catch you in my next video.